Okay, let's talk our way through uh, Crisp's first um, response to Arrington, or first uh, thing that he's picking on. So this is uh, where he's talking about autonomous desire here. And notice that Arrington is saying that a autonomous desire is a first order desire, which the agent accepts. And it, they accept it because it fulfills some second order desire. Now, I have to say, and this is a little editorial, this is really weird, right? Why do I have a des why is the relevant second order desire that I want my desire for the cosmetic to be fulfilled? Uh, I think what really they both mean here is that it's more like a second order desire that um, that it, that like endorses what I actually want. So it's more like um, my second order desire is that uh, I get beauty products which I you know, think will make me look better or something like that. So, you know, or that, so I'm endorsing that first word desire. All right. Well, anyways, the way that um, Arrington thinks that this is working, right, is that he sees the ad, okay, and then what happens is that causes a, causes him, maybe let me see if I can go up a little bit, that causes Arrington to have a desire, which is, you know, by the uh, hair dye, right? And then he goes, you know, and he does it, okay? So the thing is though, and now we're over to about, let's see where we are, about there, which is Crisp is worried that maybe this isn't actually the kind of persuasive advertising that Crisp is concerned with. Because what could be going on is that um, Arrington has a desire, and that desire is to look younger, right? And then the ad comes in, and it basically gives him new info. It gives him information, you know, about how he can look younger. So now he, because he already has this guy, he's now going to have a new desire, which is this one, you know, buy hair dye, right? And that's what leads to the action. So. It's not that the desire is somehow being snuck in under his radar, which is what Chris really thinks is going on. It's that uh, the hair dye is, or sorry, that the ad is basically um, uh, giving him a means to fulfill the desire that he already had. Okay, so what Chris thinks really is going to be a bigger case of um, of a, a persuasive advertising and one that's going to be problematic from the point of view of autonomy is the case in which the desire is getting snuck in under the radar. So the ad itself is creating a desire, um, but it's doing it because of uh, the unconscious desires that, that you know, the, the person has. So the thought is, you know, you have these like, um, maybe Arrington does want to look younger, right? But he also, and this is like the unconscious down here, right? Uh, he also has a desire for power, right? And he has a desire for sex. And so what happens is the ad, you know, he sees the ad and the ad like, you know, interfaces with those two. Okay. And by doing that creates the new desire uh, to buy the hair dye. Okay. And then he goes and does it. And the reason, one reason why this is going to be worrisome is that there, if you ask Arrington, well, why is it that you want to buy the hair dye? You know, so you're like, well, well, why do you have that desire? And he's like, oh, it's because I have this desire to, to look younger, and that's why. But really, you can see if this is really what's going on, then Arrington is not sort of aware of or doesn't have access to the desire that's really, you know, um, the desires that are really doing the work, the desires that actually create the, the hair dye desire, which are these unconscious desires, okay? All right. So... Oh, and then this is the important part here. Sorry, couldn't find it. Um, the thing is that when the desire is getting snuck in under the radar like this by appealing to your unconscious desires, it is causing you to have desires in a way that you can't um, endorse. And, you know, it's, so you're doing it for reasons that can't make any sense to you. So this is why my usual example of this is the Carl's Jr. commercial, 
where you know you see the scantily clad model eating the hamburger um you find yourself wanting the hamburger or sorry finding yourself wanting to go to ham to carl's jr but when you get there you're going to be disappointed because your desire isn't for the um well let's say hamburger ish type things that they serve there your desire is for sex and there's no sex at the carl's jr okay so now let's think about what else what else we could say about this so one possibility and this is what's going on right here so one possibility is that the chris might be just thinking okay well anything that comes about through persuasive advertising like this um it's just because it gets snuck into the radar there's like no way we can accept it we can't even think about it you know so that's why he says um why it's you know so even if it's possible uh, for the agent to consider whether to accept or reject the first order desires um so one possibility would be just like it's all hidden from you so it can't be autonomous because you don't have any say in the matter but that's probably not plausible right because you know you can still think about what things you want once you want them it doesn't nece- the fact that you want it because of a reason you know because of a means that was out of your control that doesn't mean it's going to stick around so chris has something else to say here which is that okay well remember how we started this we said that a desire is going to be autonomous if it's something that you accept so it's something that fits with your second order desires and so chris wants to s- makes use of that and he goes okay well look most of us have this desire, which is um, a strong second order desire not to be manipulated by others without our knowledge and for no good reason. Okay. And so if we have that, and if the way that, you know, getting the, causing this desire, to, I'm going to draw a lot of arrows pointing at this guy, but uh, if, you know, this is, you're coming to have this desire for no good reason, uh, and it's a reason, you know, that doesn't sort of make rational sense. I want to go to Carl's Jr. because I want sex. That makes no sense. So if that's what's going on, then you're going to be butting up against the de- this other desire that we have. So I don't even know how to draw this. Um, okay, I'll try again. So you have desire to look younger, right? So these are the conscious desires, uh, then you have the unconscious stuff, uh, right? And then you have the second order desires, right? Up here. And one of those, Crisp says, um, is going to be the desire, you know, sort of not to be manipulated. And I'll just abbreviate like that for one second, but as we'll see in just obviously it's that's not the whole story so the thought is that as long as somebody has this second order desire then that's going to block desires like this from getting endorsed because there's it the way that it came about you know by by going through your subconscious that is always going to be something that you can't actually um find to be a good reason right it 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 prevents you from wanting it to be a good reason. Now, hopefully that makes sense. So now we get into um, the kind of response to objections that somebody might raise to this. So the first thing that somebody might raise in response to Crisp's concern here, which is, hey, the um, second order desires that everybody's going to have is going to block uh, our ability to it's going to block our ability to endorse, you know, desires that come about through second order, or, sorry, through persuasive advertising. Okay, so he's got to answer, you know, concerns about that. So the first one is, well, hey, maybe sometimes it's okay to be manipulated. You know, maybe there are situations in which uh, we are perfectly fine with having desires that come about through manipulation. So Crisp has already answered that mostly by the way that he framed it okay because remember there's the it's not just a desire not to be manipulated by others but it's to be manipulated without our knowledge and for no good reason and so there's at least 
you know, so he wants to take care of this possibility that, hey, maybe we, we can be okay with being manipulated by pointing out that, yeah, sure, there are plenty of cases. Like, for example, going to see a, uh, a good actor. You don't know exactly how it is that they're causing you to want things, right? You want um, the couple in the, the rom-com to get back together, right? Uh, it's not clear to you how they're causing that, um, how, causing you to have that desire, but you're totally fine with that. In fact, that's why you're going and watching the movie. So that's the first thing that he says is that, okay, well, look, you know, we can be okay with being manipulated in some cases, but it has to be for reasons that we can accept, right? Uh, well, that's not exactly what he says there, but he changes it elsewhere. Okay. Now, the next thing he says, okay, you know, sorry, I just saw where it was. So any manipulation here I shall repudiate as being for no good reason. All right. That's to say that, you know, I can't accept the reason that I'm being manipulated. Now, the other things he wants to say are, well, you know, things he wants to say. So over here, now he goes back to his example of the subliminally induced ice cream, uh, ice cream desire. And he says, uh, the people in New Jersey would have been likely to cease their, would be unlikely to cease their craving for ice cream. So the thought is, you know, if they genuinely stuck it into our heads, then it's going to stick. You know, it's not going to be like suddenly like, ah, oh, I found out that they tricked me into wanting it, but I don't want it anymore. Because, you know, you want it. That's usually how things work. Um, unless you were like so disgusted that somehow it transferred or something like that. So this, he points out, okay, they would have been unlikely to stop wanting the ice cream, but they would no longer have voiced acceptance of this desire, right? And they would have resented the temp they would have resented the manipulation of the desires by the management of the cinema. So this is just saying that they have second order desires, which that way of making them want the ice cream would run up against and basically annoy them and make them, you know, so they wouldn't be able to accept it. So therefore those desires induced by the subliminal advertising those desires could not be autonomous because they're going to conflict with the second order desires. And this is kind of how Chris sees that conflict actually playing out in um, a real person's kind of psychology. Um, now, I'm just going to say, for my own part, I'm not super sure that that's always going to be true, right? Um, because, you know, if it one factor might be whether or not you actually like ice cream and whether you were already hungry. Um, and, you know, different people may have different thresholds for what kind of manipulation is bothersome to them. Um, you know, if you keep finding a way to trick me into doing stuff that I like doing, I might be a little annoyed, but maybe I wouldn't, you know, think that's so bad. Now, Chris can kind of answer what I just said by pointing out the, that last bit, which of his, you know, I don't know what to call it, but this little guy where he says, there's a, you know, the desi second order desire that's going to come into conflict is that you don't want to be manipulated for no good reason. And so what I'm suggesting is, well, you know, hey, maybe there's cases of this kind of subliminal advertising where you could say it's a good reason, right? Or, you know, it's a reason that at least makes sense to you. So there might be some wiggle room here. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean that Crisp is missing the point. It's just we might be disagreeing about sort of what degree of manipulation would be um, kind of like so bad that everybody would reject it. And in fact, you can see that if you go down to the next paragraph, which he says, now he's just, you know, cleaning up a couple of other little things. Um, so first, well, let's ignore this first part. Um, let's see, where is it? There it is. So he says, nor is it an argument in, in Arrington's favor that certain members of our society will claim not to have the second word desires we've postulated. Um, for this, for it may be that this is a desire that we can see that human beings ought to have, a desire which would be in their interest to have, and the lack of which is evidence of uh, profound manipulation. Now, this is the... Um... So at some level, that might be right. I'm just getting... Now, this is me talking... Um, it might be true that if you're a fully adult person, you know, and everything about, you know, sort of being in control of your, your own life that goes into the idea of autonomy, um, that pro that might mean that, yeah, you, you do have to have, you know, some ultimate authority most places in your life, but 
it's this seems a pretty strong claim that you know you are so like non-autonomous that you know like or sorry that to, to lack this desire you know of of the strength that Chris thinks it has uh, would be evidence of profound manipulation, right? Somebody's messed with you so much, there's no way you could, you know, there's really no way you could, you could not care about manipulation unless you had been manipulated. Um, so, you know, we might want to be a little careful about how far we draw that. Uh, we could agree with that sentiment in general, I guess that's what I'm saying. But we want to, might want to be a little careful about sort of how much that's going to rule out. Because it does seem like some people could be perfectly autonomous and also perfectly fine with, you know, on small things being kind of manipulated into wanting stuff. So that's uh, what's going on in this first section or the first kind of main section of the Chris paper.